Hello friends, Pastor Brinson here. First, I wanna just thank you for tuning in to this week's message. I think technology is so amazing. Whether you're downloading or streaming this message, I pray that it blesses you. And if you want any more information, or you want to consider donating to our ministry to help resources at Journey Church, go and log on to journeychurch.org. Now, get ready, get your notes ready, get your coffee ready, and get stirred up for the Holy Spirit to speak to you through this week's message. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory. We thank you for those who braved the weather today to be here. We can't thank you enough. We pray for their safety even now as they go home, Lord God. We thank you for the rains. For not too long ago, we had fire warnings and burn warnings, Lord God. And today, we have an abundance of water which brings new life. I pray that you would pour out spiritual water on us as believers, that you would flood our hearts with the message that we're about to receive. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? Would you give us the power? to put your word into practice in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So today we're going to continue on in our message series that Brinson kicked off last week. Didn't he do such a great job? Our youth, they just tore it up. And I want to start with a bit of a tweetable moment for you today. This is that one-liner. God did not die on Calvary's cross for our comfort. God did not die on Calvary's cross for our comfort. It's something we need to come to grips with early in our lives. He didn't die for our comfort. He died that we might be forgiven. He died that we might be set free. He died that we might be saved, but he did not die for our comfort. Now, sometimes we get a little benefit of comfort in this life by God's grace. Can I get an amen? God gives us some of those comforts. He puts opportunities before us, but in his discomfort, I don't, I say that lightly, I doubt it was high on his agenda to ensure our comfort. It's not something that he was going after. We live in a world, in a day and age in America, where even those who may have jobs that don't make all that much money seemingly still have an iPhone, a data plan, and an iWatch or Apple Watch or whatever you want to call it, right? We live in blessed days where, generally speaking, we have the resources that we need to get by. Not everybody, but God blesses us who are here in America. And we get all disgruntled when things get just a little bit uncomfortable, do we not? Like AC. How many of you like if the AC's out, you start to cuss and you forget that you used to cuss before you got saved, right? I don't know if I could have lived in Florida pre-AC, just me. I mean, I don't know if I could have made it here at that time. I'd have been living in Canada or something like that and talking with, hey, how you doing, hey, hey, hey? So, uh, but we work oftentimes, we experience the discomfort of our work at times so that we can do things like go on vacation. So we could buy those pretty little screens that sometimes distract us and steal our time so that we could have luxuries like air conditioning. So we often put in all kinds of energy and work in our lives for these momentary times of comfort that we often even take for granted, right? Much of our life is spent on that, but God says in his word that there's another path where we can find true fulfillment, where we can find true joy that is not temporal in nature, but lasts in this life and into eternity, and we're going to speak about that today. The topic is servanthood, servanthood, a path to fulfillment, a path to joy, a way in which we sometimes get just a little bit uncomfortable, but the end result is fullness of joy. I solicited some testimonies online. Our uh, sound guy who's normally here, Kevin Hamilton, writes the following. I started serving because it was what I was seeing in Jesus through Scripture. He was God, yet in the flesh he came to serve and to sacrifice. Through service, I got to feel what I imagined we were supposed to feel like all the time. I got to feel great. I love music, so it was a natural fit for me to find my slot on the worship team. Since I am not gifted with the ability to play a song or sing, except in the shower where I'm without question the greatest singer on the planet, (laughs) the soundboard was a logical place to land. I find myself amused when people are concerned that if I do too much, I will get burned out. 
It's pure joy. I get to serve. I don't have to serve. Looking out, I love to see people swept away into worship, and knowing that I had even a small part in it is awesome. Kevin has found his niche. Kevin has found his place to serve. He's found the place in which he gets great joy. Now, at Journey, if we start to lay out some of our culture, we, we believe here that there's always places that we need to serve out of need. Um, now, how many of you, you just get thrilled, you get excited, you get overjoyed about taking out the garbage at home? Nobody? I do because if you leave it in there too long, there's a problem that's going to start, right? I mean, so that is, there's needs like that. There's times and there's seasons where there's just needs. We have to step in and serve. We got to plug the gaps. We got to make sure everything's covered. Those are things that we need to do in this life. That's part of, you know, the reality of living here as human beings in this world, right? But there's also this place that when we're serving in our God-given giftedness, as was described by Kevin, where serving is no longer a have to, serving gets to be a get to. I get to come. I don't get burned out because I'm doing what God created me for. I have energy. I want to be there. I can't think of missing a weekend. That's the way that it happens when you start to serve in the place that God has created you for. So ultimately, we believe that we need to serve in our areas of need for a short time. But we believe that when you find your alignment in Christ, you will serve for a lifetime. So we believe that that's one of the most important things you need to figure out. If you don't know what your calling is, we want to encourage you to dive in. Go to partnership. Start to figure it out. Dive in deep. Plug into a small group. Get connected where you could begin to learn and grow and serve and figure out who you are and what God has created you to do. See, I think deep down, all of us are searching for purpose in life. What is the meaning of our existence? What am I on earth here for? Why do I get up each and every day? And I believe some of that significance and meaning is found in serving in Christ Jesus. One of our life verses here at Journey is found in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He sets the bar for us in this scripture. He tells us why he left this beautiful, awesome dwelling place so that he could save us, but so that he could serve us and demonstrate to us what real love is all about. He came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He ultimately lit, loved us so much that he was willing to serve us well by dying that we could have life. How amazing is that? He shows us the way. He tells us what this life is supposed to be all about in a world that stands in such stark contrast with its selfishness. None of us are selfish, are we? None of us? None of us? Maybe me just a little bit. I'll dive into that. I want to set a little bit of culture here as well. There's a couple of questions that I would love to have each other ask each other occasionally that would help keep us in check, that would help keep us focused, that would keep us from drifting. So one of the things, if you meet somebody new that you don't know already, I would encourage you to ask them, how long have you been coming? Notice that phrase was, it was very carefully worded. It didn't say like, oh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Is this your first time here at Journey? And then they're like, no, I've been coming for a year. What's wrong with you? You know, that would be a very awkward start to the conversation, right? But if you say, how long have you been coming, then it's a little bit of an icebreaker. You get to meet somebody. You get to hear how long they've been coming here to Journey Church. If they're new, you could help them connect. You could help them plug in. You could show them the ropes. If they've been around for a long time, you could start a new uh, budding relationship. If you already know them, certainly that's not a question you need to ask them. But you need to ask them the next two questions. The next question that I want you to ask each other regularly is, what small group are you in? Why are y'all shaking your heads or being quiet? What small group are you in? This is part of our culture here at Journey. We want everybody to be in a group. We are blessed already this semester. This, uh, this semester we had 360 distinct individuals, adults, show up in one of the Journey groups this summer. Give yourselves a round of applause. But maybe you're 361 and you're not connected. We need to help you get plugged in. 
Why is that important? Because that's the place where we do one another's, right? Where we love on one another, where we care for one another, where we meet new people, where we're given new opportunities to grow. You need to be connected in community. Every believer was created for community. And there's a unique kind of community called koinonia that we're going to talk about in an upcoming message where believers can experience in conjunction with other believers. And we don't want you to miss out on that. So I want you to ask each other, what small group group are you in? Turn to your neighbor and say, what small group are you in? You don't have to answer right now. You can answer after the service. And the next question is, where do you serve? Where do you serve? Because everybody should serve. Every believer, if that verse we just read, they could put it back up there. He came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Every believer ought to be serving. There might be short seasons where you're going through some stuff, but if those seasons turn into a lifetime, I'm gonna, things that make you go, hmm, right? <laughs> See, because what I found is that if you're serving, if you're giving, if you're going to a small group, chances are you could be a really good hider, but chances are you're growing in your walk with Jesus Christ. So there's this loving accountability that we could have with one another that helps us get connected. And if you meet somebody that's not serving or you meet somebody that's not in a group, help them get connected. Help them plug in. Come with me. Join me at my small group. Or if if that's not near you, if it's not something you're interested in, let me take you over to the next step station where we can help you get connected. Because what happens in reverse is when people aren't connected in those ways, they start to drift. They start to drift, and then before they know it, they're out there all by themselves. I had a situation where there was a guy here in the early days we loved dearly. Um, we tried a few times to get him to come back. We're like, man, what are you doing? Where are you going to church? How could we help you? And sadly, in his addiction and the grips of the pain that he was in, he didn't come back. And this morning, we got word that he just died. And we're like, man, gosh, we love that guy. We hated to see him suffering. How many times do we reach out? 70 times 7, Lord. Maybe not every one of them is going to come through, but sometimes these things have real-world consequences where people fall back into addictions or they fall back into old patterns of life, and, and then the world comes and overtakes them. As believers, might we love one another enough as we partner together in the gospel to ask these simple kinds of questions to help people stay connected so that they could be part of the body, so that they could be thriving in this life and not just surviving? Maybe you've been in a place sometimes where you wish somebody would have asked you that kind of a question and would have helped you and saved you some misery, right? Lord, would we be that kind of a church that would love each other enough to say those kinds of things? See, Jesus did set that example for us as a servant leader, did he not? One of the most favorite, famous stories is obviously the one where he washed the disciples' feet. You think about that. I mean, just think about the magnitude of that for a moment. What king, you know, like we we think of our kings today, be it Trump or whoever's the current president. I mean, they go and they get off the plane and the plane's all sweet and has all kinds of amenities on it. And there's people guiding the way for them. And they go down on the red carpet and everybody's taking care of them and everybody's serving them. And Jesus comes in stark contrast and he gets down on his knees. And it's dirty and nasty in those days. They didn't have the kind of roadways that we have. And everybody walked from place to place. They didn't have these iron chariots that they got into to drive from place to place. So he gets out and they're all dirty. And the king of the universe gets on his knees and says, I will serve you. And I will show you a better way. I will show you a different path. And he demonstrates his love actively by washing their feet as they go to the table to eat giving us a demonstration of one day we will be at the great wedding feast of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And who knows if he'll do the same for us as we go through those doors. Might we do the same for him here in this life? Can I get an amen? Amen. It stands in stark contrast to the way that I live and I feel from time to time. I don't know about you. If I'm honest, as a uh, single child, my wife will tell you, uh, growing up, you know, as a single, my mom was a single parent and I was a, a single child, so I'm pretty selfish. It's me, mine, mine, my remote, my will, my wants, my needs. So if I'm honest, and you know, I'm selfish at times, I'm self-centered. 
I want people to serve me. I mean, don't we all to a degree? How many people don't like going to a nice hotel and have somebody serving them and have the beds cleaned and everything taken care of for you when you go in there? I think in some degree we all like that. Or we go to a restaurant. Don't we want people to serve us? And don't we get frustrated if the service doesn't meet our expectations, right? I'm also tired at times. I'm worn out. I'm too busy. How often have we said that? You know what the problem with every one of those statements is? I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. Doesn't it sound a lot like the devil? The focus is all on us, but what Jesus is telling us in his word is it shouldn't be on us. It should be on others. It should be on bringing glory to the king of the universe who saved us from a destination in hell, right? So the devil has this grand plan. He wants to keep you all about I, me, myself, I. He wants to keep you so busy all the time that you can't serve. He wants to keep you so tired all the time that you can't serve. He wants to keep you so busy you can't make it to a small group on a Wednesday night. Do you get his plan? He wants to do everything he can. I mean, for the devil, it's shark week every week and you're the bait. He wants to take you out. That's his, first service was more fired up with you and they weren't half the people when they made it through the floods. I don't know what's wrong with you. He wants to take you out. He wants to keep you from putting this kind of message into practice. Lord, help us. We need to combat our very sinful nature. The Bible said he gave his life as a ransom for many. See, we need to combat this because the devil is doing his best to steal our very joy. He knows that if we're serving in our area of giftedness, if we're doing what God's called us to do, we will experience joy and we'll keep doing it because we'll know that it brings God glory. It touches others and changes their life and brings us joy all at the same time. And he hates that. Ephesians 2.10 says this about you and I. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's a lot in that small verse. You see, in my sinful fallen nature, it's me, myself, and I. I want my needs in my new creation and what God does in me. It says that I was created as his workmanship to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God's laying out a job description for you and I. He's given us a heavenly calling. Let's use a real world analogy for this. How many of you have ever applied for a job in your life? Anybody in here? You applied for a job, right? Now, when that job description didn't make any sense, wasn't it kind of frustrating? Like, what job am I applying for? What am I doing? Or maybe you did get a job and it didn't have clarity in what you were supposed to be doing. Did it not create confusion? Did it not create this sense of discontentment? You didn't know if that job was for you or not, right? But then there's other moments in life where maybe you read a job description and you're like, wow, that job was created for me. I'll tell you a short story. Um, Adam Hardigree, when Carlos was ready to go to the national stage, we were so excited for him and proud of him as he left as a worship leader going on to his next stage and his calling. Adam, uh, we met through kind of a third party intermediary and they said, hey, we, we know Journey has a job open. You and Eric need to meet. You guys should talk. You're looking for a job and they have an, an opening over there. So uh, we met with Adam and we never actually gave him the job description. We just started talking to him, and we're like, oh, this could be good. We heard about his heart, his skills, abilities. He had a resume that seemed to match what we were looking for, and we were considering extending a job to him. We're still in the midst of this offer where we're courting one another, and Adam comes to us, and he's like, you know, I apologize for, you know, talking to you. You know, I I really don't want this job. I don't think that this is the job for me. So we're like, oh, disappointing, but okay, maybe God's shutting the door, no problem. So Adam goes on churchstaffing.com, and that's a a website where, um, you know, churches that are looking for it, and he he searches Jacksonville churches, and we had posted the resume out there, the job description of what we were looking for, and Adam goes and he reads the job description, which he never received. And as he's reading the job description, it started resonating with his heart immediately. He's like, oh my gosh, 
They wanted to sow into the lives of the next generation, and I could go help the youth and try to work with them to get the youth group cranking again and get the youth group worship team going. And didn't they do an amazing job last week? They did a great job leading worship. So he saw that, and he's like, man, that's one of the things I want to do. I want to sow into the lives of the next generation. He wanted to create some original music, and we had in the job description that we'd love to see someone who had a desire to create original worship, and they did uh, Love Divine was the first song that the worship team put out, and right now they're working on another song that they're doing right now to get ready to put out. Uh, one of the future plans that hasn't been realized yet, he's only been here for less than a year, but uh, one of the future plans is that we want to have a worship school one day, and that was one of the things that he really desired. So he read it, and as he started reading it, all these check marks start to go off in his spirit, and he's like, this job, like if I was to create a job description, this would have been the exact job description that I would have written for myself. And then he calls us back up, and he's like, hey, I read the job description. Can we talk again? You know, and I'm like... He, he dissed us. I'm not going to talk to that. No, I'm teasing. So we sat down and we talked again. And yes, God had created that where it's a perfect mix. And what this thing is saying is that there's a heavenly job description for you. And some of you have already found that. And others of you are still searching for it. But let me tell you that it is there. God has a job that he has preordained for you to have inside the walls of the church, outside the walls of the church, and vocationally. He's created something just for you where you could use your unique heart, skills, abilities for the glory of God. That he would be lifted high in worship. That others would come to know him as their Lord and Savior. And yes, that you too would get great joy in the midst of that Aren't you excited? Aren't you glad? I pray you are. And heck, for those of you who are entrepreneurs, God has not forgotten about you either. Um, if you read the jobs that we have here at Journey Church that are volunteer related, you can, in fact, there's these little blue cards that say, sign me up on your chairs. I would encourage you to grab one of those for the duration of the service. Or also, if you have your app, go ahead and open up the Journey Church app, and you can look in the upper right-hand corner that it says, I want to serve. It'll list a few of those different jobs that we have out there where we're looking for people to plug in, serve, and use their gifts. But if what's on there isn't what's on your heart, you can help create a ministry, and we would love to help back you in that. See, at one time, we didn't have a ministry like Journey Out that would go and reach the homeless for Jesus. But somebody stepped up, and they said, I want to go out there and reach them. And we came alongside of them, and we helped them do that. So if what's listed there is not what's on your heart, I encourage you to still step up and say, this is what God's planted on my heart. How can we see it come to fruition? And maybe, just maybe, we can help you get behind that and see that dream become a reality in your life. We want to see the devil go back to hell where he belongs and kingdom people come to know Jesus and see the kingdom of God advanced. Amen, amen, and amen. All right. How many of you like gifts? You like free stuff? Like you like t-shirts and stuff like that? Anybody want a shirt today? We're going to give away a few. Come on. Any, this section seems a little bit more excited. How about, is this section excited over here? That one, they seem pretty excited over here. How about the middle section? This one over here. You guys are just dead. You're not getting nothing over there. This section looks pretty good. We'll try to do it. All right, here you go. You guys look pretty excited about getting gifts. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let me show you a picture of my granddaughter. She got to go with my grandparents to Toys R Us to get her gifts that my grandparents were giving her while she was on vacation. I mean, look at that pure joy on her face walking into Toys R Us for the first time. How cool is that, right? One person's clapping. So I share that with you because when you read in Scripture, guess what? Scripture says that God has gifts that he wants to give each one of us. Might we seek out with the same level of excitement a free t-shirt as we do in trying to figure out what God's created us for? He's got a gift that he wants to give you that is free in nature. He wants to implant it in your heart that will give you joy that looks like that, not just momentarily as you open your next Barbie doll or whatever that is. It is Barbie behind her. As you open your next Barbie doll but a joy that would last in this life and into eternity. Would we seek it out with everything within us? You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. 
He wants us to know this. He wants us to understand it. He says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving to the one who teaches in his teaching, to the one who exhorts in his exhortation, to the one who contributes in generosity, to the one who leads with zeal, to the one who shows acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And one last verse, we'll flip from Romans back to Corinthians. Now there are a variety of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So God gives you free gifts that far exceed any t-shirt you could ever get. If you sign up to serve, we will give you a t-shirt, I promise you. We'll give you one of those too as a side bonus. But when you discover what it is that you're created to do, for some it might be doing sound, for others it might be leading in song. Um, don't be disappointed if you sign up to sing and you stank and they don't put you up there no more. I mean, Mary Jo tries to sign up every single week and they just don't let it happen. I mean, we want people... <laughs> It's a running joke that we have, like everybody who's in worship, we get Mary Jo to go ask him, like, hey, can I sing? And then since it's the pastor's wife, they're like, oh, yeah, you can do it. And then we try to trick them. Well, sorry, but inside joke. <laughs> but uh, you want to line up with your heart, your skills, and the abilities, right? I mean, so find that place. The easiest thing to do, what I've found, is just to put your foot in the water. Amen. Sometimes the water's cold and you pull it back out. Other times it feels just right. And you're ready to dive in. So what do I mean by that? Maybe you go back there and you feel like by picking up the card that, or looking on the app that children's church is for you. And you go in the, and you meet with the kindergartners. And as you get in with the kindergartners, you figure, you know, hey, you know, maybe that particular age isn't for me. But then you go and you put your foot in the waters of the fourth graders. And you're like, man, that is perfect. I love serving with them. Or you go and you serve outside the walls of the church and you go to serve the homeless. And the first time you go there and all of a sudden it resonates with you and you want to be a part of that. The best thing to do and the easiest place to start is not doing some five billion word gift survey that they have out there online, which can be helpful, but it's to get your feet wet, to go put your foot in the water and see what you like to do. Isn't that what you did as a kid? Maybe you went out there and you tried to play softball, and if you're like me, I got hit in the head, and I'm like, the softball's not for me, right? I mean, it, it, you, you experimented a little bit. You signed up for some different things, and then you figured out what you really liked, and then you got in the groove of it, and then you enjoyed it, and it brought you great joy. I ask of you to do the same thing. So if you're not serving here today, I encourage you with all of my heart to use that app or use that blue form and sign up to serve. Get your feet wet and see if God doesn't do something amazing in your life to begin to take you towards the destiny that he's really called you to. If you're sitting on the sidelines too long, there's something wrong. If what I've just read is correct and all the scriptures that we've been talking about are correct, you were not called to be bench warmers. You're not called to be Monday morning quarterbacks. You're not called to just be watching from the sidelines. God's called you to be in the game. There's certainly those moments where you might be a little beat up. You might truly be tired. You might have a job change. You might have a shift where you're, you're supposed to and allowed to sit on the sidelines momentarily. But the ultimate goal, even while you're on the sidelines, is to get you back in the game. Every Christian was created to serve, to do good works that bring glory to the Father. We read it a little bit earlier. If you're not, I encourage you, may this doctrine that you're hearing today, this doctrine of servanthood, may it touch your heart, may it change you, may it mold you, may it transform you, and may you experience the joy that comes in serving Jesus Christ all the days of your life. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Bless you. How long you been coming? No, I'm teasing. (laughs) 
So please, don't leave without filling out those cards if, you've not already, if you're not already plugged in, if you're not already serving. So maybe you're here and you're frustrated and you are serving. Maybe you're not serving in your area of alignment. Here's what I would encourage you not to do. Don't just dump and run. Oh, Eric said I got to serve in my area of alignment. See you later, Kevin. Bye. Psh, leave a big gap for somebody, right? That's not what we're called to do. Help raise somebody up. Help go on to the next thing. Keep that gap filled as you're searching for that place where you're really called to serve for a lifetime. Because maybe you're just not in alignment. Others of you, maybe you're not serving at all. And this is the moment that God may use in your life to be your day of testimony where you hear this message and you begin to apply it and God does something very special in your life as he's done in the lives of others. So as you're contemplating that, just bow your heads for one moment. I want to share with you just two testimonies and then we're going to pray. Mary Jean Falkenstein has been around for some time here at Journey Church and she writes, I started serving because you challenged me. Hint, hint. I wanted to grow in my faith and took your advice. Now I'm in love with serving with the fourth and fifth graders. And she's doing such a great job and has created new ministries back there and kids. An amazing servant of God who found her calling in her niche. Barbara Peavy writes, I started serving because I felt we were supposed to serve. That was many years ago. But as time has passed, I realize that I am a servant. She's found it to be her identity. I've always served in some capacity even as a child. There's great joy in serving others and serving God. I personally will probably continue to serve until I no longer can. There's a fulfillment in serving others. Lord, as we gather together today, I thank you for those who have such a vibrant faith that they would be here today, that they would fight the rain, that they would brave going out when so many others chose a more comfortable route of maybe staying home under their warm covers this morning, Lord God. But these who are here specifically sought you out. They're here for a reason. You've got a calling and a purpose on their life. You've got something you wanted them to hear. You wanted them to be here this morning. And I can't thank you enough for that. Father, we've heard testimonies and we've read your word. We've even laughed together from time to time during the course of this message but Lord, may we all be the kind of example that Barbara articulated, servants from childhood until we can't physically serve anymore. Would that be our calling and our destiny? Would we quickly realize, though, and be very clear doctrinally that serving doesn't save us? We're not saved by doing good works. We're saved to do good works that bring glory to the Father. That you do something in our hearts and our minds when you save us that begins to challenge that selfish, self-centered, sinful life that we all are so accustomed to apart from you. Fathers, believers, we know this to be true. We know there's a tension that's there, Lord, and we ask that you would help us in that, O oh God. That you would remove those selfish acts of our life and those selfish tendencies and replace them with a desire to willingly serve. For those who don't know where they're called to serve, Lord, I pray that there would be many this day who would get their feet wet, who would touch their toes into the water. Still others yet who would invent new ministries that we've never even seen here at Journey Church that would impact the nations, Lord God. Would you rise up people like that prophetically that you would be known here as Journey Church, as a church who serves and that the impact would be rumbling through our streets and around the world. Father, knowing that serving can't save us, there may be some here who don't have a relationship with you. And where we started in this message today, Lord God, we said that you didn't die for our comfort. You died that we might be saved and that our sins might be forgiven. And we remember that today. If you're here and you wouldn't call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, but today's message is resonating with you, I want to encourage you to reach out and come up here to the front in just a moment and surrender your life to God and watch what changes and watch what beautiful things come as a result. For yet others, you might be that person that I talked about earlier. And you drifted. 
But today you're here. The waters that were outside, the rains brought your ship into this place this morning. And you know that you needed this message. And God's speaking to your heart. And today might just be a day of rededication. Where you say, man, Lord, forgive me for drifting. I come home to you today. And still yet others, maybe you've been a believer for some time and you've been avoiding this subject of serving or you just didn't know about it. Maybe God's putting it on your heart to serve. Use those blue forms before you leave. Is that you? Maybe you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ today. If you do, we want to celebrate with you. If that's you, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up really high and we'd be glad to pray with you. Is that you today? You need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God. I'm not completely shocked that no hands are raised because if you brave those waters today to get here, you are fired up, believer in Jesus Christ. So we thank you. This message in many ways is probably for the people who are in the empty seats today, right, or not in the empty seats. So, Lord, we thank you today for your presence, for your beauty, for your goodness, for saving us and delivering us and setting us free. I thank you for the many servants who are in this room who already sacrificed for your glory, Lord God. They give of their time, their talents, their treasures to advance the kingdom of God. And I ask you, O Lord, to bless them. While we are undeserving of your comforts, would you give us some of them, Lord Jesus? We can't thank you enough for working in and through the people of Journey Church. So we pray right now for those who are in those empty seats or who need to be in those empty seats, Lord God. We pray that you would use the people in this room to reach out to them in love and draw them in with the hope that they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Father, we can't thank you enough for bringing us here that we might live lives on mission. I thank you for the people of Journey Church and for the next 10 years that you have set before us, Lord God, to see this city one for you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for worshiping with us. If you're new to Journey and want to learn more about our mission, vision, and values, go on down to the Newcomers Luncheon. We'd love to hang out with you. God bless you, and have a wonderful day. Stay dry.